Well, we started this series called Who Am I? And the focus is not on us, but it's on Jesus. If you're going to discover who you are, if you're going to live the way God says that we should live and believe what God says we should believe, the focus cannot be on you. The focus must not be on your self-worth, on uh, your ability to feel good about yourself. Now, there's nothing wrong with feeling good about yourself, and we certainly believe that you should have self-esteem and so forth. But the reason that you get self-esteem is not by focusing on yourself, but rather focusing on Jesus Christ. And that's how you discover who you really are. Now, last week we started talking about this. We said, I am loved. And being loved is not conditional in our relationship with God. You need to understand this. Maybe you struggle with that in life. Maybe you had a spouse walk out on you. Maybe your relationship with your parents was very difficult. Uh, Maybe your boss seems to hate you. And there are a lot of negative things in your life, but I want you to understand that when you don't focus on self, but rather focus on what God says about you and what Jesus says about you, it changes everything. And then you can operate in life the way you're supposed to because you understand that you are loved no matter what your circumstances are, and it empowers you to go forward. Well, today we're going to talk about what I believe may be the most important concept for you to get as a believer. You see, this is rooted in the gospel This is rooted in the way that God wants us to live. It changes the way we see the world. It changes the way we see ourselves. It changes the way we are able to have peace and rest in our Heavenly Father. And I believe it's the most important concept you can get as a believer. And it's one of the most difficult concepts for people not to understand, but to live by. Because... By our very nature, we are wired to want to do good things, right? We want to get the gold star. We want to win first place. We want to get the blue ribbon. Um, I don't know about participation trophies. Who cares about those? But we want to win. That We're wired that way. We're wired to please our parents. And this is a concept that I believe is incredibly, incredibly important for the Christian life. And here it is. I am righteous. Now here's the problem. We know that we're not. I can say I am righteous, but I know that I've sinned. I I know my behavior from the past. I know the things that I've done wrong. And so when I say I'm righteous, what does it feel like? It feels like you're being a hypocrite, but not when you understand the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So today we're going to look at this great human struggle. I believe one of the great human struggles, uh, two of them actually, are dealing with shame and self-righteousness. Now, shame and self-righteousness are really two sides of the same coin. I want you to understand this. Shame and self-righteousness are both rooted in self. They're both rooted in my opinion of myself. They're both rooted in my power, my ability. They're not focused on Jesus Christ. Let me explain that. Shame uh, causes me to be defensive, to project. It causes me to pretend, to live with a cloud in my life. Shame causes me to live in fear and pain and to withdraw because my shame keeps me from doing things that I should do. It makes me uh, desire not to interact with others. And shame really hinders my relationships. It hinders my outlook in life. It hinders how I work. Shame can drive people and it can destroy people. So that's one side of the coin because you're looking at self. Now, for those of you that struggle with this because maybe your self-esteem is is tied to your failures, and we all have failures. We all have a past. We all have sinned. Maybe your shame is just cyclical with this because you've never gotten off that shame merry-go-round. I want you to hear what the Bible says about you, and this is a truth. You see, you've got to determine who you're going to believe. Most of us believe the devil. 
But Jesus said about him that he is a liar and the father of lies. He does not tell you any truth. He wants to destroy you. He is a murderer from the beginning, the Bible says. And, and so the idea for us that if we're going to follow what Satan's philosophy is, the powers of this world, then you're going to live in great defeat because you're going to say, I can't, I'm too bad, I'll never be good enough, my past is too sordid, there's no way anyone could love me, God could never use me if people really knew what was in my heart. That's what shame does. But you have to decide if you're going to believe the truth of God or the lies of the enemy. Listen to what the truth of God says, Romans chapter 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. No condemnation. So therefore, I am declared righteous in the eyes of God when I put my faith in him. Now, the flip side of that coin of shame is self-righteousness. Self-righteousness leads to a superiority complex. It's the holier-than-thou person. It's arrogance. It's Here's the thing about self-righteousness. Self-righteousness doesn't necessarily think that you're perfect. It just thinks you're better than everybody else. And, and therein lies the real sin of that pride and that self-arrogance and that self-righteousness because you are trusting in how good you are. And think about this and the ridiculousness of this, that most human beings, if you ask most Americans, how do you go to heaven when you die? What does it mean to be right with God? How do you be made right with God? Most Americans are going to say something along this line. you got to be a good person. Keep the Ten Commandments. Do better. And if you ask the average person, they would not easily or readily admit that they have sin. They would not easily or readily admit that they've been separated from God because of their sin, but rather they're going to tell you how good they are. Well, I tell you what, I know Mary Sue down at my job, and Betty, I'm tell you what, she says she's a Christian, and if she's going to heaven, I know I'm going to heaven. You know what I'm talking about? You ever heard that? The fact is, self-righteousness says to God, I'm good. Can you imagine the arrogance of walking up to the holy God of the universe, the absolute personification of perfection and holiness and saying, I'm good, I'm good, I'm a good person. Well, that is as ridiculous as it would be for me to go to NASA and say, hey, I, I should be running NASA. What is your qualification, Mr. Miller? I make a mean paper airplane, I'm telling you, so I should be able to run NASA. Well, it is far more ridiculous for me to proclaim my goodness before a holy God than it is for some idiot to do that uh, at NASA, okay? And so shame and superiority, superior, this uh, self-righteousness leads to what I mentioned the other week about moralistic therapeutic deism. In other words, this whole idea of my relationship with God is for God to pat me on the head, give me a gold star because I've been a good boy, I've been a good girl, and his job is to make me feel good and to be happy about everything, and ultimately he's the giant ATM in the sky uh, that just spews out cash every time I need something. And this idea of moralistic therapeutic deism is not the gospel. It is not rooted in the work of Jesus Christ. It is rooted in the work of myself my self-righteousness. And I want you to see that neither of these is the solution. I cannot walk around in shame, and I cannot walk around in self-righteousness, because when I do, I'm rejecting the gospel. Listen to what Romans 10, 3 says about this self-righteous attitude. For they being ignorant of God's righteousness, there's the key, God's righteousness, when you get ignorant of that, when you don't understand how he is righteous, then you're in trouble. And seeking to establish their own righteousness, you see how that conflict is? You're comparing your righteousness to God, you're going to lose. It will lose every time. They have not submitted to the righteousness of God. So what he's saying is this, until you understand how God is righteous and right and holy, and what he has done is just 
uh, through Jesus and the work on the cross and the sacrifice that Jesus made for us, then you're going to try to live in your own righteousness. And by doing that, you're rejecting the righteousness of God. You're rejecting the gospel is what he's saying. So what does that mean? Well, by understanding that I'm righteous, not by my good deeds, not by my good works, but because of Jesus, I am able to live by the life-changing power of the gospel and put off shame and self-righteousness. Therefore, for believers, for those that have put their faith in Jesus Christ, they must learn to say and to believe, and I believe to come back to regularly, even daily, I am the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. I am the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. That teaches us that it's not my effort, but it's the works of Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean God is not, God is not against effort. God is not against you trying hard or being disciplined or having a schedule uh, or you planning out your life. In fact, he's in favor of that. This idea of being righteous because of Jesus, it just takes the burden off of you. It doesn't mean that God wants you to sit on the couch and, uh, you know, live in sin or never do anything or, or just never get involved in the game. That's not, what, that's not what grace is. God's not against your effort. God's not against your discipline. God's not against you doing something good. He's just against you taking the credit for it or believing that it all depends on you, all right? So with that said, I want to read to you, I believe, a very important passage of Scripture, maybe one of the most important passages of Scripture on this concept, all right? I am the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. Uh, look in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17, and we're going to read through chapter uh, 6, verse 2, just a few verses. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Everybody say brand new. God says you're brand new. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. Referring to new life in Christ, the old has passed. Do you still have an old nature as a believer? Yes. That's the part of you that sins and lies and steals and gets angry uh, without cause and does all kinds of things that are wrong, and you have bad thoughts. That's the, that's the old nature. The new nature is what is deposited in you through the power of the Holy Spirit. The Bible teaches us that when you get saved, the Holy Spirit dwells in you. He lives in you, the Spirit of Christ, and you are God's temple. So you now have a new nature. That's the part of you that after you become saved, you think, man, I shouldn't have said that. I shouldn't have done that. Lord, I, I, I can't believe that I did that. Okay? You have a conscience, but you also have a new nature. So he says, the old is past, and the new has come. He said, all of this is from God. This is important for you to know. All of this is from God. It's not from me. And uh, who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting to us this message of reconciliation. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. In other words, we are God's representative. God making his appeal through us. Did you know that God has you here so that others can see the gospel in you? He says that you are his ambassador. You are his messenger. He says, we implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God for our sake, and here's the key, for our sake he made him to be sin who knew no sin. What he's talking about? Talking about Jesus. Jesus was the perfect, righteous son of God. He was the law giver, but he was also the law keeper. He kept it for us on our behalf. That which we could not do, he did for us. By the way, in case you're wondering, you can't keep the law. The Bible says if you fail on one point, you failed on all. You see, if the standard is perfection, which would be required for you to go to heaven on your own good works, then even just a little slip up means that you failed. It doesn't matter. It's like jumping across the Grand Canyon. It doesn't matter if you almost make it or if you just barely get three feet. You're still going to fall to your death. The point is not how far you can jump. The point is it's impossible to jump across the Grand Canyon. And in the same way, it's not that you're as bad as someone else or better than someone else. 
uh, sure, that happens, okay? There are going to be people in this world that you're much better than. Nobody's going to argue that point. But the point is, you're not good enough to be good as God. And so he says, he made Jesus to be sin. In other words, Jesus not only came to this earth as a human being and lived a real human life, he was God and human at the same time, but he kept the law. He was the only human ever to do it. He was perfect and without sin. And he did it for us. But what he did on the cross, even though he was a perfect human and did not deserve that death, what he did is he became sin for us. In other words, he literally took the sin of the world upon himself and suffered God's punishment for sin so that God is righteous and holy. He doesn't allow sin to go unpunished, but it's your choice. You can either choose Jesus' payment for it or you can pay for it yourself. I choose Jesus. I choose Jesus. His is a whole lot better. And so he says he made him to be sin for us who knew no sin so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. In him we might become the righteousness of God. So when you receive Christ, you are in Christ it is in him that you become righteous. So it's not your works, it's not your good deeds, it's not your effort, but rather it's the work of Jesus Christ. So um, anyway, he says, um, working together with him, then we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. Have you ever wondered about, maybe you've read that before. What does it mean to receive the grace of God in vain? I believe there are a lot of Christians that fit that category. They've received the grace of God. They become a believer. They become a follower of Jesus. They just don't live and rest and receive the grace of God. They still, you see, in the same way that it, it requires God's grace to become a Christian, to become a follower of Jesus, it also requires the grace of God for you to live for Christ, to be a growing believer. It's not your effort. Once again, God's not against effort. He's not against discipline. He's not against any of that. He's just against you living with God's grace in vain. Rejecting the grace of God, thinking that you can do it on your own, is going to lead, lead to failure every single time in your life. So he says... Don't receive the grace of God in vain. For he says, in a favorable time I listened to you, and in a day of salvation I have helped you. Behold, now is the favorable time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. So you see there is this urgency to this. And so what God wants us to understand is that there is an urgency to understanding this idea of the grace of God. That I am righteous because of Jesus Christ. Not because of me, not because I'm good, but because of him. Now I want to just give you three thoughts. I've got about 10 minutes and I'm going to give you this and we'll wrap this up. Three things from this passage that I think every one of us should learn and let it be front and center in our lives. Number one, here's this. You are a new creation. Once again, we're talking about for those that have received Christ. If you've never received Christ, if you've never trusted him as your savior, I hope you'll do it today. Okay? Today, he says, is the day of salvation. Now is the time. Don't put it off. But for those that have done this, listen very closely. You are a new creation. You're brand new. God has made you new. And there is something that you can hold on to here that God will change your life. He will bless your life because you're new in him. I am a righteous person because I'm a new creation in Christ. So God made you new. You're different than before. And it's God's doing, not yours. You need to understand this. You're new. And it's not just because you started going to church. It's not just because you say, hey, look, I, I turned over a new leaf. I don't, uh, any longer, I don't smoke, dip, or chew, or run with girls that do. Right? That does not make you righteous. Might make your breath smell better, but it does not make you righteous. Right? And I've shared with you before, like the church I grew up in, uh, they had some weird rules. It was a sin to go to the skating rink, but because half the people in the church grew tobacco for a living, it was okay for teenagers to stand on the front porch of the church and smoke between Sunday school and church. So anyway, just, you know, we make up a lot of rules a lot of times that really have nothing to do with Christianity. Here's what he says. You're a new creation because of him. 
not because of your effort. It's all God's doing, he says. Um, all this is from God. All of this is from God. That is a huge thing to remember. He says, you're a new creation. The old is past and the new has come. Let me read you a passage that I think helps us understand this of how we're new. It's in Colossians chapter 1, verses 12 through 14. I want you to see these verses. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you. I've got three words underlined. I want you to see. He has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. And he has delivered us from the domain of darkness. And he has transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Now I want you to see those words. First of all, he has qualified you. When you come to Jesus, do you know that you're qualified? You say, well, I've got, I've got a lot of sin in my past. I've done a lot of bad things. It's not that you qualified you. He qualified you. Isn't that good news? He qualified you. So when you start thinking that you've sinned too much or you've gone too far or you've waited too late, understand that it's not you who qualifies you. It's God who qualifies you. He qualified you, and then he delivered you from the domain of darkness. Thank God. He delivered you from that old way of living, that old way of thinking. He has delivered you from the defeat and the despair and the pain of living apart from Jesus Christ. And thank God he has transferred you to the kingdom of his son. So in other words, it's like you're already there. You're already guaranteed. You're already signed, sealed, and delivered. And so it helps me to understand that I'm new in Christ, and it is not because of my effort. Here's the second thing I want you to see in this passage. You are Christ's representative. You're new, and because of this, here's what God says about you. He gave you this ministry of reconciliation, and you are his ambassador. We are ambassadors for Christ. And here's what I want you to understand. God not only saved you to take you to heaven, and we put so much emphasis in our modern culture on the sweet by and by, when I die, I'm going to go to heaven. And yes, that's true. But we forget that eternal life begins now. There is, and you read all throughout Scripture in the Old Testament and the book of Revelation, how that God eventually, that the gospel doesn't just end with you praying a sinner's prayer. It doesn't end with you saying, okay, I'm breathing my last breath, now I'm going to go to heaven when I die. The gospel entails Jesus coming back again and he's going to set everything back to its original order, back to its original purpose. There will be a new heaven and a new earth, and you are going to live in a resurrected body. If you're a believer, you're going to live in a resurrected body forever. Quite astounding, to be honest with you. And we don't talk about that a lot, but it's a part of the gospel. And here's what I want you to understand. You're Christ's representative. God did not leave you here just to fill some skin and to fill some time before you go to heaven. You're his representative. You're his ambassador. Therefore, it behooves us to live that way. Not to live with self-righteousness like we talked about. There are a lot of Christians that live with self-righteousness. Therefore, they are the professional rock throwers. Anybody that sins differently than they do, they're fair game. We'll boycott them, we'll curse them, we'll make them look like evil people, but we won't talk about our sin. We won't talk about the sin of self-righteousness or gossip or, or whatever. You see that, what I'm saying? You're Christ's representative. Don't do that. Be the person not filled with self-righteousness or the person filled with shame. The person that's filled with shame will never share their story. They'll never tell someone else about Christ. They'll never share what God is doing in their life. Why? Because they're ashamed of it. They're embarrassed. They're afraid somebody might ask them a question they don't know the answer to. Let me just help you get over that. You don't have all the answers. Okay? If you're waiting till you know everything, the answer to every question, you're going to be waiting a while. I don't know all the answers. And I admit it. Sometimes people ask me stuff and I'm like, they think, what do you think about this? And what does the Bible mean here? And I'm like... I don't know. Now, I know that might be shocking to some of you because you think I've got like a bat phone to heaven. And every time somebody asks a question, I'm like, uh, God, yeah, uh, you know, uh, Sally and John over here, they're asking, uh, you know, what about this? And, and, and I don't know what to tell them. What should I say? Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh, uh, oh, really? Okay. All right. I'll tell them. No, 
That's not the way it works. Okay? If you think you're going to have all the answers to all the questions before you make a decision for Christ, you're not. By the way, what other thing in life do we hold to that standard? You've gotten married. You've gone on a date. You've been in a relationship before, and you definitely didn't have all the answers to all the questions. You didn't even know what all the questions were, all right? Much less all the answers. But why do you do it? Because of love, right? And so what happens to us is often is that we, we fail to be an ambassador because of shame or self-righteousness. Don't do either. You're God's representative. And then here's the third thing, and we'll be, we'll be done with this. You are to be productive, he says, working together with him, then we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain. He says, don't receive this grace of God in vain. Don't let it be wasted on you. He said, now is the favorable time. Now is the day of salvation. Now is the time to take action. You are to be productive. Now I want you to understand this. God has called you to be faithful. And I hear people say this a lot, and it's true. God has called you to be faithful. And people are like, well, you know, does it really matter if you have success or not? God just called me to be faithful. Now, hold on a second. God has called you to be faithful without doubt, even if you don't see the fruit that you'd like to see, even if you don't see the results you'd like to see or expect, God calls you to be faithful no matter what. But he also calls us to be fruitful. He said, Here, Jesus said, herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. God did not save you and leave you here without purpose. There's a reason that you're here. You're to be productive. And as a result of that, I can understand that I am righteous through the great exchange at the cross. Not my self-righteousness. Not my shame. And God said, don't let this grace be in vain. And here's what my challenge for you today is this. You are the righteousness of God because of Jesus. Not because of you. Definitely not because of Richie. And not because of Avalon Church. We say that Avalon Church is the perfect place for imperfect people. And the reason for that is you're not the righteousness of God because of the great things at this church or the great people at this church. And there are some great things done here. And there are some great people there. And I love every one of you. But it's not according to you. It's not up to you. It's not because of you, it's because of Jesus. And as a result, I can say I am the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ. When you get this truth, it'll change your thinking, your attitude, your outlook, and your Christian life. But it begins with believing it. And so today, the challenge is that you believe it. Uh, I've said this before, uh, right living begins with right believing. It doesn't begin with right doing. You can start out with right doing and you'll fail. But right believing leads to right living every time. When I believe that Jesus is the answer, the gospel is what I'm supposed to build my life around, that I am the righteousness of God through Jesus Christ, it changes everything in my life. Thanks for joining us at Avalon Church. Share this message with a friend and make sure to subscribe so you don't miss a single video. You can also join us every Sunday live on the Avalon Church Facebook page. If you feel led to give and support our mission of bringing people wherever they are into a growing relationship with Jesus Christ, you can do so by clicking the Give button. Thanks again for joining us. We'll see you next time.